Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending from where you are dialing in. Welcome to our online conference. My name is Matthias Weller from the University of Bonn, and it is my pleasure to host this conference together with my colleague Lira Bilski from the University of Tel Aviv, to whom I will pass over in a minute. This conference is the culmination of a unique academic project a cross-border and interdisciplinary class at our universities on Nazi looted art and provenance research. The idea for this class is a, a byproduct of the Restitution Dialogues, an international conference series whose first event took place at the University of Tel Aviv in December 2019. Further events are planned in Toronto and London. And I cannot thank enough my Tel Aviv colleagues for having embarked additionally on our innovative and challenging teaching project that we are presenting tonight to the public. My special thanks to you, Dira, as well to you, Rachel Klagsbrunn, and to you, Eyal Dolev. On our side, the joint lecture is part of a project on an Israeli-German dialogue on provenance research and restitution, a project set up together with my colleagues from art history and provenance research here in Bonn, Ulrike Sass and Christoph Zuschlag. Both of them are with us tonight. My special thanks to you. And our initiative from the Bonn side is funded by our university's program of excellency in its transdisciplinary research funding lines. Since, of, since October of last year, since the winter semester, 30 students from Tel Aviv and 30 students from Bonn have come together each Wednesday night, like tonight. Welcome to all of you again, good to see you. And in our weekly classes, we discussed on presentations on the subject matter in comparative perspectives, one week labeled as law class and the other week as provenance class. We had the great privilege to welcome a number of outstanding experts as guest speakers from all over the world and from all backgrounds. There is this saying that sometimes it is the lecturer who learns most from his or her lecture. And I would certainly consider myself as a candidate in this class. And I'm still really struck by the positive and academic atmosphere I perceived in these classes on a very difficult and troubling topic. I believe we managed to address real issues and to discuss them from different angles in mutual respect and thereby intensely pushed the frontiers of our knowledge and understanding further, not only in respect to issues themselves, for example, the sometimes really complex mechanics of restitution regimes in place in European countries, both early post-war and today's under the Washington principles, but also and foremost for each other as such. Remembrance of the Holocaust is a key issue to all societies, in particular, of course, to the German society. And I think we agree that a meaningful remembrance must be substantiated by profound and precise knowledge. And I would say that such knowledge and understanding comes about most powerfully in comparative perspectives and context. I believe that our class made a contribution in this respect and I'm sure that tonight's conference will do so as well. The overwhelming resonance to our invitation from all over the world seems to indicate this. We received an unbelievable number of almost 400 registrations. People are still coming in. And we may start thinking about our digital classrooms and conferences as something like a global invisible college perhaps the ideal format for a truly global topic. And I will allow myself at the end of this session tonight to announce a bit on what is in the pipeline in the near future. So stay tuned and be an active member of our college. With these remarks made, I pass the floor to you, Lira, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you in a bit more detail 
your perspective on our class and tonight's conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias, and welcome, everyone. Let me join Professor Vela with a warm welcome to everyone who joined on behalf of the Minerva Center for Human Rights and Tel Aviv University Law Faculty. My name is Leora Bielski, and I am a professor of law and uh, the director of the Minerva Center uh, of Human Rights uh, in Tel Aviv University. Tonight's conference is the culmination of a unique class, the first of its kind in Israeli universities, a class dedicated to the subject of restitution of Nazi looted art and provenance research. The class was a direct result of our 2019 Restitution Dialogues Conference and was initiated and organized by two of its participants, Professor Matthias Veller and Mr. Eyal Dolev. I thank you both. I also want to acknowledge Ms. Rachel Klaxbaum, the Executive Director of Minerva, whose work and dedication made this class possible. I would like to say a few words on the idea behind tonight's conference. The class, as you heard, focused on the issue of Nazi looted art. It approached the subject in a truly interdisciplinary way, combining law, art, and history. It also adopted a, a comparative legal approach to Israeli and Germany and to the various national restitution panels. Today, in our conference, we wanted to expand a little the framework in several ways. First, we wanted to go beyond Holocaust restitution to discuss other restitution struggles, such as the post-colonial restitution demands addressed today to European museums. How much can the 1998 Washington Principle offer solutions to other struggles and what are the hurdles created by the hegemony of the Nazi looted art restitution model? Can First Nations struggles in Canada, for example, offer a different model? Second, we wanted to add a comparative historical um, uh, perspective in order to better understand contemporary approach to restitution. In my own work, for example, I return to the early post-war Jewish struggle that focused on books and not on high art, advanced a collective restitution to international Jewish organizations as trustees, and replaced a private property approach with a, a reparative, future-oriented approach. Tonight, we would like to hear more on the history of restitution struggles, for example, in Italy, how the restitution of cultural heritage was used as part of a nation building effort and how at the same time demands of the Jewish community and individuals were ignored or marginalized. Third, we wanted to add philosophy to the conversation. What can philosophy tell us about the theoretical assumptions of contemporary restitution? How do they treat time and temporality? And what is its understanding of works of art? Why art? What is unique about a work, a work of art? Is it simply part of the larger material turn in Holocaust research, given the approaching end of the, of the era of the living witness? I would like to end my introductory remarks telling you about a unique exhibition that opened in Israel yesterday. Its title is Yamim Michutz Lazman, uh, in my translation, Days Beyond Time. It was sponsored by the Theresien House and invited contemporary Israeli artists to listen to video testimonies of survivors from Theresien Ghetto who are today in their 1990s and to create art inspired by these testimonies. The claimed motivation for this project is to save memory, to give it a material existence through art, to transform the act of testimony into art. 
But what struck me was the place of art vis-a-vis -vis restitution. Instead of trying to do justice by reversing time, by returning a work of art to its original owner or heirs as an act of belated justice, here the art was the end result. The testimonies focused on time and change and memory, and the artist became first a sympathetic listener, creating a hybrid intergenerational mode of testimony, and then created a relational understanding of works of art. I came out of this exhibition thinking that the restitution dialogues that are informed today by experts such as lawyers, art historians, provenance researchers, etc., should invite artists to the conversation to contemplate together the future of restitution. So now I would like, I'm honored to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Bianca Gaudenci. Bianca Gaudenci is research fellow at the German Historical Institute, Rome, and at the Zukunft uh, Kolleg University of Konstanz, as well as a postdoc at Wolfson College, Cambridge. Her current research project um, analyzes the politics of restitution of fascist looted cultural property in Italy, the Federal Republic of Germany, and Austria since 1945 within the bigger framework of the process of coping with the past. In particular, it focuses on four central points. The shift from amnesty to amnesia of the immediate post-war years, the role of heritage in the post-fascist politics of the past, the persistence of anti-Semitism and the role of Jewish associations up to the 1998 Washington Declaration. Her publication include a special selection section of the Journal of Contemporary History entitled The Restitution of Looted Art in the 20th Century, Transnational and Global Perspective that came out in 2017, and a special issue of the International Journal of Cultural Property entitled historicizing the, the restitution of Nazi looted art, 1945 to the present, and it, is forthcom it was forthcoming in 2021. Is, is it out already, Bianca? Okay, so uh, I welcome you now to present. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Leora, Matthias, and Rachel for organizing what promises to really be a really stimulating uh, conference, and in particular to Leora for the super kind introduction thank you the idea is um today to um take a relatively quick trip down memory lane uh, to see how the process of restitution of fascist looted art unfolded in the three main post-fascist countries of western europe that is austria the federal republic of germany and italy from 1945 to 1998 year of the washington declaration as we know uh, so, by, first of all, by fascist looted property, I mean cultural objects, which means both a bit like Leora was saying, both uh, big precious collections, but also everyday items, also books, but also tea uh, cups and so on, often um, of a, not only everyday value, but also of a considerable emotional value sometimes, which were looted by both the national socialists and the fascists from state owned as well as Jewish owned uh, private and communal collections. In particular, I like to take these 20 minutes to present you in an overview of how restitution was presented and even questioned in the public sphere in order to shed light on on one side, the role played by restitution in the struggle to come to terms with the past so the process of Gangheitsbewältigung, and on the other side, the political relevance of cultural heritage in post-war nation building and also identity building, both communal and private and, and, and individual um, on this other side. 
While the restitution of national collections, as you can see from this slide already, these are the Uffizi being returned, you know, pomp and circumstance in the summer of 1945. So the restitution of national collections took place almost in its entirety in the immediate aftermath of the war. And according to my interpretation was staged as a cathartic rite of passage through which these uh, countries aimed at being reborn as rightful members of the international Western sphere. The restitution of Jewish property was a prolonged affair marked by silences, oblivion, and even outright expropriation. This became evident as early as 1951, as the Allgemeine Jüdische Illustrierte summarized in one of its bitterly act tools that you see here. Now the cartoon uh, presented Vida with Mahong, so the reparations, as a version of the famous uh, board game Parcisi and caricatured the incredibly frustrating and uh, Kafkian uh, bureaucratic maze that any survivor, as it says here, or the heirs had to suffer through with no apparent successful outcome or ending whatsoever. If you see it at the end, it just it, they get lost into a forest of paragraphs. I put the translations um, on the side. I hope you can read them. Um, now, the cartoon includes very accurate and telling references to contemporary Western German society. I unfortunately don't have uh, the time to go into detail here, but uh, please feel free to ask me more about it during Q&A, maybe. I would really only like to draw your attention at this point to number 16, where you can see there's a banner that says, um, we will continue to Aryanize. And um, it's a satire of the establishment of the union of damaged Aryanizers, as they call it, which means uh, is a reference to the growing wave of resentment that had taken shape in the Federal Association of for so-called lawyer restitution, which in turn referenced the increasingly popular idea of uh, third party buyers or in good faith buyers. Now, the result of this maze uh, was a prolonged and extremely strenuous quest for restitution, which despite the actual very significant volume of property returned in the 40s, as I'm sure you already looked at in the course, engendered an acute sense of frustration, discrimination, and even second expropriation, as art historian uh, Sophie Lillie has argued, for many, many years to come. As a result, still in the early noughties, public figures like Stuart Eisenstadt could describe the half century between the substantial restitution efforts of the 40s and the large scale restitution campaigns of the 90s as a so-called 50 years wait for justice. So we discussed this also with Leora at some point. Um, now, how did this 50 years actually pan out? How was cultural restitution depicted and debated in the public uh, sphere? And what can it tell us about how these three countries processed their involvement in the Holocaust both during and after the Cold War? To answer these questions, today I'm going to illustrate a number of case studies, which in my view are representative of three distinct phases in which restitution was implemented, but also hampered or even questioned. First of all, the first phase, which focuses on the initial wave of restitutions that took place more or less between 1945, even earlier, and 1950, in Italy, as in other countries, juxtaposing the much publicized return of state collections, which were looted or removed during the Nazi occupation, and the partial restitution of Jewish owned assets, as exemplified by the case of Leo from Milan, which we'll see in a minute. A second phase, that of reaction, illustrated by the Hans Deutsch affair, a defamation campaign against restitution lawyer Hans Deutsch, whose anti-Semitic undertones marred significant sections of the West German press between 1964 and 1966, but even up to 1973. And finally, a third phase, which we could call partial awakening, exemplified by the fate of the controversial Mauerbach depot, famously described as the gallery of tears, 
a repository of so-called hairless artworks, which came under serious scrutiny, especially from the mid eighties onwards. Okay, so first of all, um, I like to draw your attention to one of the particularities of uh, the restitution discourse, which has been nurturing the European rhetoric of cultural restitution for decades, in my opinion, and still partly hinders the process of coming to terms with the past, namely the question of state collections, which in Italy, like in France, but also other countries, were given total priority in the aftermath of the first of the Second World War. Now, between 1945 and 1950, many, many public events were organized to celebrate the return of several unique uh, state collections removed or looted um, between 1943 and 1945, which included the Uffizi, right? Like we saw in the first, uh, in the first slide with the US Army bringing back in all pomp and circumstance some of the 750 masterpieces. Um, of many of uh, these events included also the two national exhibitions of artworks retrieved in Germany. The first one of which opened in uh, November 1947 and the presence of the New Republic's main political personalities, as well as uh, General Clay. You can see it, you can see them here on the top uh, right. Um, and was emphatically publicized through a series of press articles and pamphlets. Here in the middle instead, and I really like to, to um, focus your attention on the photo in the middle, you can see the famous Rodolfo Siviero was the head of the retrieval office, uh, very theatrically admiring uh, Tiziano's Danae, which was a symbol of this phase, first phase of restitution. The painting had actually been taken from its wartime shelter Monte Cassino by the Göring division in 1943, then gifted uh, to Göring and eventually stored at Alcazie before then being retrieved. And it's now again in uh, Cap uh, Capo di Monte in case you're planning a trip to beautiful Naples is definitely worth seeing. So these events and the exhibitions in particular were conceived with the barely conceal concealed aim of putting on display the so-called pillaged Italian national heritage as a means of not only manufacturing a sense of national cohesion through the concept of national heritage, designed to overcome the internal divisions of fascism and civil war, but also of reinforcing the so-called victim myth, not the, of the good Italians, but also Austrians, as mere victims of Nazism, in order to whitewash or um, cancel together any responsibility or even mention of fascist crimes, which included first and foremost Italy's role in the persecution of its Jewish citizens, but also its ruthless colonial practices. Now, such collective as Misia, as uh, Leora has said, uh, was to strengthen itself over the following decades and did not limit itself to Italy. I like to point this out. Now, at this point, um, I like to underline that none of these many, many, many publications contained any reference whatsoever to Jewish objects instead, nor to fascist connivance or active participation in their looting, not one. Even in the rare instances where um, the question of Jewish property was actually instead covered by the press, its credit treatment was rather exemplary of the peculiar course taken by Post for Italy in elaborating its anti-Jewish persecution. Um, this was the case of Leo, uh, forced to flee to Switzerland uh, for racial reasons, as they called them, who upon his return to Milan discovered that his collection of antique books and pre-Columbian statuettes had disappeared. Now, according to his own inquiries, um, some of the books magically quickly resurfaced in the window of an antiquary bookshop less than a block away from his home. This is a really long and complicated uh, story. So I'm just going to summarize. The very complicated investigation that ensued eventually led the police, who finally got involved, to Leo's porter, who, um, when interrogated, claimed to have received a parcel 
with the books by a certain Luigi, by him only identified as a member of the SS, which was indeed a very typical name for Waffen SS, no, Luigi. Now, not much is known of how the story ended, unfortunately. One of the manuscripts that actually already been sold to a British collector was never retrieved. Whereas uh, the entire contents of his home in Varese, a town nearby, which included two Chinese uh, antique vases and a box of books. And you can see here on the right, the list of uh, items that were very carefully cataloged and instead made it to the storage rooms of the Ejeli, which was the fascist state agency entrusted with the confiscation of Jewish property. Now, even in this case, so in the case of um, the objects confiscated by the Ejeli, it took Leo more than 18 months to get his property back, as testified by the over 150 pages, including his dossier in the archives. This is all just correspondence between him and the offices. And during these months, the Ejeli functionaries, who in many cases were actually the same people who had been in charge of the expropriation, by the way, exasperated uh, Leo and others with their absurd requests, requests for taxes and paperwork, as testified by his many telegrams. You can see here an example. Now, Leo's case well exemplifies the local, even personal, and often improvised character of many of the plundering actions carried out during the Solo Republic. And this is very important to keep in mind. At the same time, and possibly even more importantly, it especially testifies to how plundering is often presented as a German or rather Nazi enterprise, even when it blatantly was not. Italy was, however, not the only country to struggle with coming to terms with its past. Even in the case of West Germany, which, as we know, did make considerable efforts to return over one million objects, the growing wave of resentment that I was talking about, of the so-called lawyer buyers, slowly turned into a full-scale attack on the principle of Wiedergutmachung itself, as evidenced by the Hans Deutsch affair. Now, the Hans Deutsch affair, which ran partly in parallel with the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials, is in turn a clear demonstration of the attitude, very widespread at the time, of projecting all responsibility for the Holocaust onto the Nazi party, with hardly if any reference to broader society and common citizens. Deutsch was a successful Austrian Jewish lawyer and publisher who had already worked actually on many restitution cases, and who in 1964 was accused and arrested for swindling the Federal Republic of Germany uh, for, of a total sum of three, 35 million marks in the case of the Hadvani collection. Now, Ferenc Hadvani was a Jewish uh, Hungarian ma sugar magnet whose art collection of over 200 valuable paintings, including works by Renoir, Picasso, and Greco, and valued at over 400 million marks, had reportedly been stolen by the SS during the occupation of Budapest. Um, so in the late 50s, Deutsch agreed to take the case and both parties finally agreed on a settlement of the famous 35 million marks. Because restitution claims were usually settled at around maximum 10% of the actual value. Trouble started two years later when a dispute over Deutsch's uh, fees caused the finance ministry to suspect him of not having handled the case properly. This turned basically into a crusade, and finally charges were dropped only nine years later, leaving Deutsch a broken man, basically. Now, I don't have the time to go a bit more in detail here, but I would really like to draw your attention to is that over the following months, or actually years, the attitude of large sections of the West German press as well as the several ministerial employees who had often been trained or rose to prominence during Nazism, made very clear just how much the resentment had grown into a full blast hate campaign whose anti-Semitic tones would prompt the site to dub it a German Dreyfus affair in 1971. 
the Spiegel in particular, and I put two examples here, besides uh, painting Deutsch as a big fish with uh, powerful friends who had cowardly spent the war years in Palestine with no reference whatsoever as to why I would actually have to, um, was really exemplary in turning the crusade against Deutsch into a much more comprehensive attack on the principle of the reparations itself. Up to that point, barely tolerated and now openly questioned. You can see here, for example, on the right, in one of the more sober articles, the Spiegel resorted to very low quality reproductions of two of the paintings with the very misleading caption, the Federal Republic paid over 70 million marks for them. Um, as for the collection itself, the Hatvani collection, some of the paintings actually resurfaced uh, at some point at several auctions and museums, eventually revealing that the collection had in fact been looted by both Nazi and Soviet forces and dispersed both during and after the war. This was also the case of um, uh, John Constable's beaching a boat, Brighton, that maybe some, I mean, hopefully many of you were already before with, which was stolen and uh, sold on the black market uh, immediately after the war. You can see here the export license. The painting was eventually then donated to the Tate in, in the 80s. Um, as discovered by the British Spoliation Advisory Panel, which then recommended a restitution in 2014 and again in 2015 after the Tate's appeal, quoting the moral strength of the claimant's case. Now, to sum things up, the Deutsch affair, in my opinion, well exemplifies not only this phase of reaction, as I've called it, which peaked in the early 60s, but also uh, of what I would describe as the shift from a politics of the past of um, Western integration, typical of the Adenauer and Herard eras, to a further reaching Vergangenheitsbewältigung as a process of social integration. That is a deeper awareness of the role of the state, administration, and Germany society at large that would characterize the period of the 1960s uh, revolts, Ostpolitik, and the Tant. Now, the third case that I'd briefly like uh, to bring to your attention is that of the contested Mauerbach depot, transferred to Austria in 1955 upon the condition that the country would make every effort to return the artworks. Now, in December 1984, journalist uh, Andrew Decker denounced how over 30 years later, over 8,000 artworks were still stored in Mauerbach despite attempts by the Austrian Jewish community to initiate the return. It actually wasn't the first time that the, the, the poll had been brought to under public scrutiny. And several prominent figures had already campaigned for its disclosure in the 60s, including Simon Wiesenthal, who, as you can see here, also devoted one of the chapters of his memoirs. Um, by the time that the art news expose came out though, anticipating the Waldheim scandal by two years, times were finally beginning to change. From the Austrian side, actually, at the beginning, many first uh, tried to minimize the value of the artworks by describing Mauerbach as the late toplets of the art world. This opinion was actually shared by renowned art historian, uh, Pierre Schneider, who, while debunking the myth of the Mauerbach treasure, managed to get to the core of the issue, namely the fact that not one single shot had been fired in Austria during the Anschluss. At the core of the matter was in fact the repeated refusal of the vast majority of the Austrian authorities and public opinion alike to acknowledge, let alone process, the involvement of ample sectors of Austrian society in Nazi crimes. It still took up to the end of the Cold War though to find a rather patchy solution. In 1995, the Republic of Austria finally transferred all holdings to the Federation of the Jewish Communities of Austria, which in October 1996 had them auctioned uh, for the benefit of needy victims of the Nazi regime, even though actually some of the legitimate owners could uh, probably have been identified. And you can see the ad here at the, the announcement here in the middle. Okay. Um, now I'd like to 
draw your attention to the Malbach case because the heated debates that surrounded this case are, in my opinion, exemplary of some of the issues that often make restitution very difficult, even nowadays. Among all, uh, the question of class disparities, which have often been exacerbated by policies that have addressed individuals rather than communities, especially in the 90s. As the London Times provocatively pointed out during the Maobach auction, while a small number of Holocaust survivors managed to acquire some of the artworks, and here I'm quoting the article on the right, other Jews, too poor to enter the fray, watched in silence, clutching their catalogs. Okay, so to conclude, to wrap it all up, <laughs> I would like to um, draw your attention to four main points, basically. Um, as we have seen then, the process of restitution played a pivotal role in the cathartic rebuilding of the Austrian, Italian, and West German national communities after World War II. Especially between the immediate aftermath of the war and the, in the late 60s, the rhetoric of restitution represented an extremely useful means of staging a clean cut with the fascist past on one side, while at the same time placing all blame onto Nazi Germany in the Italian or Austrian case, or on the Nazi leadership in the West German case, in order to exculpate the state apparatus and the Austrians, Italians, and Germans who had actively taken part in the expropriation of their fellow citizens and neighbors. As a result, at least until the mid 60s, restitution was often implemented as a way of actually avoiding having to deal with the Holocaust and its aftermath, both in social and political terms. For decades, the rights of the legitimate owners were thereby not only forgotten in certain cases, but sometimes even once again violated. Even when restitution to Jewish citizens or communities did take place, in fact, the process sometimes turned into yet another instance of discrimination or loss human as well as material, or in the best case scenario, provided an alibi, and this is crucial, an alibi that reduced the process of restitution to a simple financial transaction, the void of social and political meaning, which also meant that this could then be questioned, right? Like in the Deutsch, like in Deutsch's case. Far from constituting a mere exercise in cultural diplomacy, Restitution played a central role in these three countries' attempt to rebuild a certain sense of national cohesion through the political use of heritage, often at the expense of any reckoning with their anti-Semitic past, as a means to overcome the ghosts of Europe's fascist past. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca, Thank you very for much. This, uh... A wonderful and insightful presentation of yours that included uh, three perspectives uh, on uh, three uh, countries, three case studies. Of course, it would be an extremely interesting question to further compare them and to see what um, uh, common structures we might see. A victim thesis, uh, I think, is present everywhere. It would also apply to Germany um, and other structures may appear to us as recurring and as such worth of uh, uh, further discussing. We will do this at the end of our program tonight, as we did it in all classes before. Uh, first intense input and then um, a common discussion of uh, all the presentations. So it is my duty, so to speak, to move on to our next uh, intervention. And uh, it is my pleasure to present to you our next uh, distinguished speaker, Alexander Herman. Alexander, you are director of the UK-based Institute of Art and Law, and uh, you co-direct the Art, Business and Law LLM developed in partnership with the Center of Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London. Alex uh, writes regularly on restitution issues for the art newspaper and has been quoted frequently in the press, including the New York Times, The Atlantic and other media. Uh, uh, Alex is the author of the new book, Restitution, the Return of Cultural Artifacts, published by Lund Humphreys, which provides an up-to-date 
overview of the topic and has been called fascinating and insightful and a penetrating analysis by commentators. It is a great pleasure having you here tonight and uh, listening to you uh, on the return of cultural artifacts, the post-colonial case. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you to Professor Veller, to, to Professor Bilski, and everybody involved um, at the Minerva Center and at, at the University of Bonn. It's a great honor to be, to be on this virtual panel, um, to be squeezed between a historian and a philosopher, um, two paths my, my life uh, never took, but I always would have wanted to be a historian or a philosopher. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, the life path that I took took me to, to law. But what I think is very interesting about this particular area of restitution is that it inevitably touches on legal issues, but also issues of history, like we just heard from, from Bianca, and issues relating to philosophy, specifically in relation to ethics. So what interests me most about questions of restitution um, are those cases that involve historical wrongs and our attempts to redress those wrongs in the present. So we're inevitably confronted with the weight of history, uh, with the challenges of the past, of reliving the past, and we're trying to do justice in the best way we can in the present. And I think that touches on those issues. It makes this, this discussion tonight, I think, especially interdisciplinary, just as much as it is interjurisdictional, because we're all in, in different countries as well. So that is what I find so fascinating about this issue, and it caused me to write a book about it. So obviously, these are, these are questions that, that I'm always trying to answer, trying to find out more information about um, in order to see where we are today in relation to restitution. And it was very interesting hearing from, from uh, Bianca Godenzi before, um, talking about that, that time between 1945 and roughly the late 90s, um, when it didn't seem like restitution was really um, a, a, an important feature in, in the societies of, 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 of those three European countries. And now I think we're in a very different place, certainly in relation to Nazi looted art. And the question that I'm posing, I suppose, um, on this panel this evening is whether we're heading in a similar direction in relation to colonial era takings and items that were removed during the colonial period where, when European countries uh, went out and colonized other parts of the world. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to provide clear answers on that, but it's more just to get a sense of the direction of travel. Um, but I do think it, it is quite stark when we consider that, that historical period that Bianca was talking about and then compare it to today. I think there's a much greater sensitivity, obviously, to issues relating to the Holocaust um, and certainly more sensitivity now increasingly in the last few years in relation to, to the colonial past, which is a, in a sense a past that goes back even further in, in, in time. Um, and so I'm going to try to bring all of that together over the next 20 minutes or so and try to see where, where we are and what kinds of decision-making processes can be, can be envisaged in order to reach ethical decisions. Um, ethics is always something that I think is very difficult to define and very difficult to, to prescribe. And we'll, we'll try to get a sense of where we've been in the last 20 odd years in relation to Nazi looted art in order to give us a better picture of where we might go in the next 20 in relation to colonial era uh, removals. So as uh, Professor Veller mentioned, I'm, I'm the director of the Institute of Art and Law. We're often dealing with the legal side of, of, of restitution um, matters um, as commentators and also involved in some ways in, in, in drafting as well, uh, guidance and, and codes. So that's why we find this um, an interesting area. And what I thought I would do is start by looking at some of the, the, the specific legal problems with bringing claims in relation to historical events and act actions. So um, there are numerous legal challenges. Uh, this is an image uh, of, of a man trying to jump over a hurdle. 
Uh, it looks promising on the left, uh, but then by the time you get to the last image, you realize it was a, an, a, a hurdle that was too difficult to overcome. And that's generally what happens when faced with uh, legal challenges, um, claims in relation to historical losses or events that took place many years ago, more than a generation ago, sometimes a hundred years ago, are inevitably faced with challenges um, when brought to, to courts of law. Um, there are a number of these. I'm not going to go into all of them. Um, the one I thought I'd focus on is, is, is the one that, that I've put in bold, uh, limitation periods or prescription periods. Um, these are periods uh, of a passage of time a uh, number of years usually in which a claim has to be brought. Most legal systems in the world will have uh, equivalents of those, those periods. Um, that's something that allows the law to reject claims um, that relate to events that took place in the distant past. Um, the law, in a sense, is not built to deal with the problems of history, or at least on its face, not built to deal with those problems. And we can investigate what, what mechanisms might exist instead. Um, but that's one of the problems, is, is the existence of these limitation and prescription periods. There are a number of other um, issues that, that arise whenever claimants try to raise these, these cases in court. Now, there are occasional exceptions. Um, and these sometimes offer hope for claimants looking to bring uh, claims, whether in relation to, to Nazi looted art or potentially other types of, of, of cultural objects that have been taken. Um, initially, after the Second World War, there were laws that were passed in a number of European countries um, that allowed for the annulment of transactions that had occurred during the Nazi period. Um, but the problem with these is they were, they were time limited, and oftentimes the time limit was, was rather short, um, putting aside, of course, the, the challenges that claimants faced, as we heard in the, in the last presentation, um, with, the, with the general um, uh, opposition in society to, to these kinds of claims and those who were, who were bringing them on behalf of victims. So those existed for a period of time, now not really relevant, uh, with a few little limited exceptions. Um, another way in which claimants might think of bringing um, their claims to court is to look towards the United States. Um, the U.S. generally, um, this is quite a general statement, but can be more favorable um, to claimants bringing claims relating to um, property that was lost in the distant past. Um, certain states, and it will depend on the state, um, might have laws that are more uh, more generous in a sense to original owners of property um, and in a sense allow them to 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 file their claims um, in in those in those courts um, that's obviously subject to a number of those general hurdles that I talked about earlier and as a result it's very rare that you see even in the US jurisdiction a case going all the way through um, to a final judgment on the merits it usually gets held up um, on the preliminary questions around jurisdiction limitation periods, etc. Um, there are also some federal laws which are interesting in the United States. Um, the Holocaust Expropriated Art Recovery Act from 2016 that effectively harmonizes the limitation periods um, to a certain extent extends them to allow claims to be brought in the court system in the United States relating to artworks and other property that were lost as a result of Nazi persecution in Europe. Um, and there is also, in another area, the Native American Graves Repatriation Act of 1990, uh, or NAGPRA as it's, as it's known, and that places an obligation on museums, certain museums in the United States, to repatriate uh, human remains, but also other types of, of objects, ceremonial, funerary, um, or, or cultural objects. So there is actually a positive obligation to, to return. So that's quite interesting. But those kinds of laws are, are quite rare. And there's no other country in the world that has an equivalent to that piece of legislation in the United States, even other settler countries with indigenous populations. Um, there are also possibilities. These are, in a sense, more theoretical than, than practical right now um, in relation to international law. So if you have trouble 
bringing your claim in a domestic legal system. Um, there might be some norms of international law that can help um, support your claim, um, but that's very difficult to actually get that to an international court uh, like the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Um, but it's been written about quite a bit, and it's an area, I think, of, of great scholarship. I'm not sure if it's necessarily something that will, that will lead to major restitutions happening, but it's there. Humanitarian law, which is the area of law that, that relates to armed conflict and occupation, or sometimes there are avenues um, in, in humanitarian law. And then human rights law as well. Um, there are pretty good arguments that, that the right to access culture and to participate in your cultural life of your community might give rise to some, some larger notions of, of restitution. Um, that's something that I know Evelyn Kampfens in her, her recent book um, has, has addressed that, that relationship between uh, human rights law and, and claims for restitution. But on the whole, these exceptions are, are rather um, limited. The general law still imposes those, those restrictions on claimants. And then on top of that, you have the, the famous or the infamous, depending on your perspective, legal restrictions that exist in certain countries in relation to um, public collections or collections in national institutions. So the law will restrict um, certain institutions from actually removing items from the collection, even if it is to, quote unquote, do the right thing and return um, material to, to original owners. Um, France, of course, has its famous rule of inalienability of its public collections, um, which means that if you want to remove anything from a French public collection, even uh, a little thimble, um, you'll need to pass a special law, and that needs to go through both, both houses of the French parliament, which is obviously easier said than done. So very difficult because of that added level of, of legal restriction on public collections. The UK has, has, has um, uh, a restriction for national collections, not all collections, just the main national ones, with, which gives them really only a limited power of disposal. There are now some exceptions for human remains and Nazi looted art, but generally speaking, it's relatively difficult to remove items from those collections um, and restitute them. And then lastly, uh, just a point about cultural objects on loan. Um, if a claimant ever thought that when an item enters their jurisdiction um, on, a, on a loan for an exhibition at a museum or gallery, that they might be able to then bring a claim there. Um, unfortunately for them, um, a number of jurisdictions have immunity from seizure for cultural objects on loan for that very purpose. So that's another frustration, I think, um, for, for potential claimants looking to bring um, their claim through the courts. So because of the lack of avenues available when it comes to legal claims, we turn, of course, to um, the ethical arena, the ethical turn. Um, and we need to understand what we mean by ethics because it's often a term that's bandied about somewhat. Um, as I admitted at the beginning, I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not going to be able to define it uh, the way our next speaker might be able to. Um, but what I was able to do is to find a definition um, in a trusted source of mine, which is my computer's dictionary. And um, I think this helps I th in getting a sense of what we're, what we're looking at when we, when we consider ethical decision making in this area. Um, ethics is a set of moral principles that guide the human conscience. Right? So these are decisions that come from our, from our individual conscience. Um, they are a set of, you could say, norms that exist in society that motivate us to act a certain way or not to act a certain way. So obviously it's not going to be as prescriptive as the law is. We can't ever predict ethical outcomes, um, nor do I think there can be single ethical outcomes in particular cases the way there might be in, in courts of law. Um, you might be faced with situations where there could be multiple ethical outcomes, and each one of those would be ethically justifiable. Um, not one of them is better than any of the other. Um, so that confuses matters. And I think sometimes when the media engages with questions of restitution, when the public tries to engage with issues of restitution, it's this ethical arena that is most difficult, because they might not understand why was it that this 
decision um, went one way and another decision the very next year on similar facts went another way. I think that's a problem that I know uh, Professor Veller at, at Bonn is working on in the restatement, um, but I think that's an inevitable challenge that we're always facing in, in, this, in this area, getting our head around uh, the multiplicity of, of, of ethical decision making. I thought before I got into the question of how we can render uh, ethical decisions, um, I wanted to just say a few words about um, what I would call ethical practice. So before we get to a position where we're trying to decide whether to restitute a work of art um, to an original owner or to a country or community of origin, um, it's important to understand the day-to-day -day practice of ethics in institutions, especially museums. Um, and museums are often um, supported by sector guidance, so that means they have guidelines that they can follow, um, and ethical codes. Uh, in the museum sector, um, they are often supported by ethical codes, um, and those together, I think, help to, to facilitate ethical practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So in terms of sector guidance, a couple of examples. This one, many of you who work in this area would probably know about it. Um, this is the most recent iteration of the, the German um, guidelines or the Handreich Hung um, in dealing with Nazi looted art in, in German collections. Um, that first came out in 1999, right after the Washington Conference. Um, and then it's been updated twice. The most recent version is from 2019. Um, and then if we move over to the uh, colonial era and colonial context in museum collections, um, we also have a, a very good uh, German guidance on that. Um, and this one has been updated three times in three years. So uh, something is accelerating. I don't know what's happening, but uh, this one has been updated that many times um, since it was first published in 2018. I think what that shows is just how quickly the ethical landscape develops in a sense, how the practice is developing. And it develops much faster than the law develops. The law, if you want to change the law, you have to go through the legislature and it takes, you know, it can take years or it could never happen. Whereas ethical changes, I think, can occur much, much faster. And the sector usually does a pretty good job of responding to those changes, the changes in the ethical landscape. And as a result, we see, you know, frequent updates of, of, of sector guidance. In terms of ethical codes, um, the one I always like to go back to, mainly because it's an international one, and most museums that any of us would ever set foot in are going to be members of this particular organization, it's ICOM, right? the International Council of Museums. Um, and they have a code of ethics. It's been updated a few times. Um, the most recent version is from 2013, and they rebranded it a few years after that. Um, but this is it. Um, and if you look closely, I mean, it talks about what I would call the ethical practice of dealing with countries and communities of origin. And 6.1 of the Code of Ethics says, museums should promote the sharing of knowledge, documentation, and collections with museums and cultural organizations in the countries and communities of origin. Right? So that's a proactive requirement. They should share knowledge. We're not even talking about restitution claims here. We're just talking about sharing and engaging and collaborating with um, institutions in, in, in um, countries of origin. So that's, that's an important aspect, I think, of, of what museums need to consider when they're dealing with these contentious parts of their collection. So what would that include? Um, I won't go into these in great detail, but you have familiar areas like provenance research, transparency, right, being transparent about your collections and the provenance history of those collections, um, community engagement, and that doesn't just mean the community in your backyard, but also overseas communities, communities of origin, as we just saw, partnerships, developing partnerships with those communities. And then lastly, I think it's important for institutions to have clear policies um, on caring for this type of material in their collections, engaging um, as they do, and in potential restitution repatriation claims and how they would deal with those. So it's not just a question of actually returning the items, it's also a question of being transparent about the process that you would follow if a claim were to come forward. And it's not, not even just claims, it's also just a request for information or perhaps a discussion at a very preliminary stage. So we're not yet at that point of the actual claim 
um, being made to the museum or to whatever body is going to decide on that on that particular claim. Um, and then I just thought I'd end this slide on um, 6.2 in the ICOM Code of Ethics, which does start to talk about return of cultural property. And it says museums should be prepared to initiate dialogue for the return of cultural property to a country or people of origin. So we're not yet at the restitution part of the Code of Ethics, but we're just showing that museums need to be open to the idea of restitution, that they shouldn't hold on to absolutely everything in their collection just because they were established as a museum to hold on to items in perpetuity. Uh, we're starting to see a, a more open um, view of what a museum can be in the 21st century. And I think ICOM reflects that quite nicely. Um, I did want to talk about um, the features of restitution claims in relation to the Holocaust and also in relation to um, colonial era removals. Um, but I think uh, just because of t time ticking away, I might pass this through. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll post something on our um, blog on the Institute's blog, um, I think there's the link down there, um, to, tomorrow or maybe on Friday, um, putting, putting a lot of these ideas together um, on paper. And uh, so you can read about that there. But what I did here was I tried to, to compare the features of restitution claims for Holocaust looted art um, and then for, for claims relating to, to colonial era removals. Um, and then lastly, I think we need to talk about ethical decision making. What is it? How do we make sure that decisions that are made in relation to restitution um, are ethically defensible? Um, firstly, we need to ask, well, what kinds of bodies should be making these decisions? Um, I think there are a variety that can. Um, we often think because we know about the restitution panels in five European countries, we think of them. Um, that's an obvious one. Um, but there are also bodies like museums. Oftentimes these decisions are made by museums themselves following the guidance which I talked about earlier. Um, so those decisions could be made by the boards of the museums if they're so empowered. Sometimes museums will have restitution committees, subcommittees, um, that will make recommendations to the board. There are internal processes by which these, these occur, but museums themselves, depending on how empowered they are, might be able to make these kinds of decisions. Um, legislatures or parliaments, I put that there because in some cases it's necessary, especially in a country like France. I mentioned the inalienability principle, which basically means that if you want to start restituting property from French public collections, uh, you will need laws that are passed through the French parliament. So as a result, um, the issue is going to be decided on one way or another um, by the parliamentarians. You might also have a system where it will be government ministries that will be making that decision, um, sometimes with advice from panels or bodies. Uh, so you might have the final decision being made by a minister or secretary of state for culture or that portfolio in a particular government. And then lastly, you have this, this idea of the national committee or panel, um, usually an advisory body, so they would advise um, the minister or the secretary of state who would make the ultimate decision. And I already mentioned, but in relation to Nazi looted art, many of you are probably familiar with the, the five um, panels that exist in relation to restitution claims um, in Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, France, and the UK. Uh, I'm not going to go into their practice in great detail, but obviously I'm going to um, uh, reference the work that the University of Bonn is doing um, in, in, in its restatement in looking at all of these recommendations that have been made by these panels over the last number of years and trying to make sense of it because um, no one has really done that yet and I think it's a necessary task. So um, obviously the national committees are important when it comes to understanding how ethical decisions are made. Um, and then when we turn to colonial era uh, removals and restitution claims in that space, uh, we don't yet have anything equivalent to that, um, but if you pay attention to the news, you'll see that proposals are being considered in a number of European countries um, where there would be um, advisory committees or advisory panels that would be established. Um, Belgium seems to be going down this route in its relations with uh, Congo, former colony, um, and restitution of, of items from Belgian collections. Uh, France, um, there is some talk. The French Senate is very keen on this particular um, path, but uh, I don't think President Macron 
is is particularly enthusiastic about it. He's he's looking to take a different um, approach, but he has an election coming up, so probably bigger fish to fry than um, fighting the Senate over over a restitution panel these days. Um, and then finally, the Netherlands, um, a really interesting proposal um, from a from a special committee at the end of 2020, which seemed to be approved by the Dutch government, but that was before the recent um, election, though it wasn't that recent, but recent in the sense that now they have a government. So we'll see what happens going forward in the Netherlands. So that's that's something that's being mooted, you can see in a number of European countries. And we can always compare that with um, with the experience of similar advisory panels in relation to Nazi looted art. Um, and then I'll end on this um, last point about um, what I think are the, the ethical benchmarks for um, uh, decision making for these kinds of bodies, whatever they might be, whether they're museums or indeed advisory panels. Um, the first requirement is for the body to have legitimacy. Um, it seems rather, rather obvious, maybe something that you would take for granted. But sometimes it takes time for that legitimacy to develop. Um, it's not something I don't think that, that arises overnight. Um, and so the longer a, a, a body has been around making these kinds of decisions, I think that the legitimacy grows. Um, so that's an important aspect, legitimacy. Usually the, the composition um, of the decision-making body, um, are they well-respected members of society? Is it a balanced membership so you have all sides covered? That's also important for legitimacy. So you need a body that's basically well-recognized by society and has the trust uh, of society. And there I'll reference Nicholas Luhmann, who thanks to Matthias Veller, I, I learned about in his um, paper in Evelyn Campen's book in 2015 um, on legitimacy through, through procedure, which I find a fascinating notion. Um, the second uh, benchmark, I think, that's necessary for ethical decision making is um, a relation to process. You need a fair process, procedural justice, procedural fairness, as it's sometimes called. Um, this doesn't relate to the end decision that's made, but it relates to the process that the claimant would have to go through. Is it fair? Is it transparent? Is it clear what the steps are? Has it been made clear in advance to the claimant um, and even to the museum what the, what the different steps and requirements are? And then lastly, is there an element of participation? Is it a participatory process? Now that might sound um, a little bit like an idealist's view of, of the way these processes work, but I think the more participatory it is, the more collaboration there is with the claimant um, and, and the museum on the other side, I think the more legitimacy the, the decisions um, will have. And then lastly, um, in terms of the actual decision that's made, um, it, it will have to involve the consideration of all relevant factors. I think whatever the decision-making body is, they will need to take on board all relevant factors. What that means is you don't exclude certain factors based on certain principles. In law, that happens all the time. Courts will exclude evidence um, if it's unreliable or, or if it's hearsay evidence. There are all sorts of technicalities that exist in the court of law um, that would mean that some evidence just never makes it to the decision maker. I don't think that should happen in, in terms of ethical decision making, even if we're talking about evidence that comes from a long time ago, sometimes oral evidence, things like that. All of that needs to be taken into account, weighed up effectively by the decision-making body, and then the decision um, is made as a result. So I think I'll stop there so I don't uh, tread too much on, on the next speaker's time, and uh, happy to answer questions when we get to the Q&A. So thank you again for inviting me, and I look forward to the rest of the proceedings. Thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, we heard about uh, legal hurdles, especially limit, uh, times, limitation times, so the temporal was here. And we heard about the ethical turn, which uh, seems to point to uh, the people of origin or to the countries of origin in uh, colonial claims. And I think we are going to hear about all of this from our next a speaker, a Professor Chagi Knaan, who is a professor of philosophy and the chair of the philosophy department at Tel Aviv University. Professor Knaan, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Professor Knaan 
uh, specializes in 20th century continental philosophy with particular attention to aesthetics and to the philosophy of art. In recent years, his work has focused on the ontology and ethics of images, showing how images always involve an interplay between the aesthetic and the ethical. Uh, Knaan is the author of the present personal philosophy and the hidden face of language that came out in Columbia University Press 2005. Another book is The Ethics of Visuality, Levinas and the Contemporary Gaze, which came out in 2013. And most recently, Photography and its Shadow, that came out in Stanford University Press 2020. Professor Knahan has also written on how the concept of restitution can be used today beyond its historical and legal scope in thinking of disagreement and conflict in the interpretation of arts. The title of his presentation is What is a Hermeneutics of Restitution? So, Hagi, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Leora, for the introduction. Thank you also for, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I, I was thanking you for, for the introduction and for the invitation to participate in this uh, very stimulating conference. Uh, I thank, of course, the um, uh, Professor Veller, your, your co-organizer, and I'm happy to join the group on a topic that, that really is so significant these days. Um, I should say that in terms of my professional experience, I participate here today as a guest to the field of restitution studies. I'm not an expert on the complex history of, uh, nor on the current dynamics of restitution. And of course, not on questions of public, uh, of policy making in this field. Um, since I come from philosophy, um, my interest in this cultural historical phenomenon is a philosophical one. So I'm, I'm interested, I should say, in the concept of restitution and in the kind of ontology and phenomenology um, that it entails. So what I'll try to do in this short 20 minute talk is uh, look at the framework of restitution um, in philosophical eyes, look with a philosophical eye at a very rich, uh, complex practice. In fact, the matrix of practices in the plural that have at the matrix that has expanded and grown, grown rapidly uh, in the last decades and have done so in specific ways since the declaration of the Washington Dis uh, Principles in the late uh, end of the 1990s. So I think that this burgeoning praxis that we are all dealing with here has drawn in a variety of experts and opened up new kinds of expertises, which is of course interesting in itself as a fact about the sociology of knowledge uh, but I think that at the same time, it is also indicative, I assume, of the fact that this practice is profitable to someone at least, and that it serves certain interests that should be recognized as regula regulative. So I won't be opening the whole question, which I think is an interesting question. What kind of motivates uh, the whole, this whole complex matrix of restitution? but I put it kind of on, on the shelf to, to, to look at later. Um, in the interesting discourse that developed uh, among the different kinds of um, experts, experts in art law, in international law, in taxes, and of course, the people who come from the legal side know the nuances of it in cultural heritage, et cetera crisscrossing with uh, historians of all kinds, positivist historians, but also critical historians, such as, for example, Bianca, who I think showed us something very kind of interesting about how uh, the return of looted art is not only a happy end, but 
as much as it kind of uncovers things, it also recovers them in new ways and um, deciphering this very interesting dynamics uh, connected also to national identity, to the relation to the Jews, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's this very um, complex grid, which historians typically can decipher. And as, being a philosopher, I'd like to somewhat de unlearn this grid. That is, look at it in a way that is maybe, uh, would seem at first sight simple. Of course, the many cases that we deal with, the case studies are really, uh, there's a whole range, a whole spectrum of case studies, and we need to be very careful of the particularity of each case, how it differs from other cases, what's unique about it at the same time, how it also resembles other cases. But I'd like to say, or oh, that's, my, that's my sense, um, that there's a certain picture, a uh, conceptual picture, um, underlying the kind of rhetoric or the discourse of restitution. And I would like to say something about this discourse and perhaps um, shed light on a certain aspect of the discourse that I feel is absent or missing. So art restitution um, typically is understood as a process, right, of amendment uh, that is brought into play when under certain very extreme conditions, say, of injustice, such as genocide, crimes against humanity, and probably there are other categories, a certain artwork, and I will concentrate today on artworks, maybe we could later on make the distinction between artworks and cultural artifacts, a certain artwork is taken and dislocated from its original home, so to speak, from its state of origin, from its original sphere of belongingness, which typically coincides with a sphere of ownership. And the fact that the artwork was the legal, uh, ownership means that the fact that the artwork was the legal property of someone by, by purchasing it or, by, or as a matter of inheritance. But again, we have a starting point often called origin. It can be a state of origin. It can be an original owner that is, of course, no one thinks it is the original owner. It could be the third original, uh, the third owner in a row, or the fourth or the tenth owner of the of the work of art. But for the for the specific um, study of a of a restitution case, that's that's the point of of beginning. And we, in a way, something happened that disrupted the 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 situation. That is, the owner uh, had the, the the work, the work of art. It hangs naturally, originally in their home. Um, of course, no one thinks that naturally means uh, we should take the word too, too seriously, but it belongs to a home or to a museum, to a collection, uh, until the storm, so to speak, comes in, until the storm arrives. And with the arrival of the storm, the turmoil, conditions of change, and then we have a whole new story beginning. The aggressor violates the status of ownership, art is looted, taken, sometimes taken, but while being bought, purchased under all kinds of circumstances, ridiculous, horrific circumstances. And then time passes. And here we find ourselves today when the Nazi regime is uh, so many years um, behind us. We look back and try to reconstruct the situation to understand it retroactively. And as we look back, the original owner, of course, is, is often no longer with us. The aggressor is also dead. And uh, the artwork, if located, may belong to a completely new context, a new museum, a new owner that was or wasn't part of at all of the original scenario. So there's somewhat like a, to use it metaphorically, like a fall from Eden. There was this primal stage, then there was this primal sin, so to speak, and we are now trying to cope with the results. In this context, the ultimate, ultimate question, it seems to me, that I hear when, when people speak about restitution, I think it also showed in, in Alexander's wonderful talk, 
is how, how to negotiate between the sides. The sides are not always two. Sometimes the, the situation is complicated. How to give proper weight to the different, often conflicting concerns in order to arrive at what so, is so often called the fair and just solution. I should tell you that as an outsider to the field, when I hear the phrase uh, fair and, out and just solution quoted and used again and again and again and again, I kind of, a, a question mark appears to me. And meaning that we have to ask ourselves, what do we mean exactly by fair? What do we mean by just? Um, but, okay. But in any case, there's a problem that needs to be solved. And the solution of the fair and just solution often means that we need to do away with the problem. To solve the problem is to do away with it, to fix it so there will be no problem. And uh, in uh, Alexander Herman's very clever book, which I read for, the, for this event, uh, which I liked a lot and really I learned a lot from, a very humane book, I, I should say. I think that um, part of kind of the, what, what Alexander you call the ethical turn uh, implies a, a need, a, a necessity to move uh, before, um, outside of the legal system, um, not only because of clear reasons that you, you put very, that are very illuminating, which you articulate in very illuminating ways, the fact that legal systems were part of, uh, of the situation allowed in, in many ways uh, for art looting to be legal. And also today, or at least since the, say the war made it difficult for claimants to receive what was originally theirs. But there's something uh, else that you, I think are looking for when you talk about the ethical term, that is you operate or you under, you, your intuition is that the legal terms are not enough in order to understand the complexity of this human uh, situation, interaction, temporal conjunction, etc. And I would, you ask what ethics could mean. We could begin even here with something relatively simple of what of the question of what we owe the other person, what one owes the other person. That could be extended, of course, what we owe a museum, what we owe a certain nation, what we owe a people, but the idea that we have a certain debt to someone else uh, could perhaps uh, uh, work here. And of course, the, if we use it, I think this is central to the dilemmas that are, um, that are uh, at stake and, um, and they are at the center. That is, we have an object, the object is called an artwork, a work of art, etc. But what's at stake really, as you put it, is how the two human sides interact, how one pays a debt to someone that one didn't necessarily of, um, a harm or what is our, in other words, relation to the other person. And here, um, um, Alex, you already brought in the idea of the different temporalities of restitution. And I should only kind of quickly locate it in a, in a philosophical sense um, field and say that today when, when people think of ethics and philosophy, the kind of the standard field of reference is the present the now, that is to be ethical is to be ethical, ethically, to behave ethically now at the present towards someone else. In recent, uh, in the recent, in the last decade, for example, another dimension of temporality opened up very strongly in, in ethical studies, and this is the future. And there's a whole, the whole kind of field in ethics called the uh, ethics of future generations. That is not only what I owe you now, but also what I owe people who would come after me, my children, your children, other children, what do I owe this planet? And for example, the whole discourse about the, the ecological crisis often goes together with considerations about futural ethics. 
Now institutions, as you pointed out, there's also a, a um, um, dimension of the past that is very strong. And with it kind of a very intuitive claim that we owe something to the people of the past. Those especially who were um, wronged, who suffered injustice, etc. I accept that and I, 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 I embrace that, but I want to say that philosophically it's not that clear. Why should we necessarily owe something to someone of the past? This is something I think we should kind of work and try to, to arrive at a, a better understanding of. So I think that what's so interesting in, in, the, in the dynamics of, of restitution is really that it, is, uh, it involves all three, what Heidegger calls ecstasis of, of time. It kind of, it, it, you cannot think of restitution without thinking of the present, the past and the future together. Um, so let me now, um, let me now uh, kind of move on. So at, at this, the picture that I, that I um, uh, gave you, I think that there is something missing, as I said. I mean, we see that there are the protagonists, etc. And the question is, what is missing? And what I would, or, or whose voice is missing? Or what kind of voice is missing? What kind of protagonist is missing? And I would say, what's missing to me, again, as an outsider, is the work of art. We hear the claimants, we hear the other side, we understand the kind of considerations, but where does the work of art come in? And that's what I want to, to basically I'll, I'll bring up a, a PowerPoint then uh, maybe embarking a bit on the discussion and i have to um, open the uh, chat now and also the possibility to um, to start uh, the video and uh, to to open your micro and there is a first question from someone who bears the same a family name like mine, but uh, who does not belong to my family, and this is uh, Michael Weller. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Matthias. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. <clears throat> and I have a question to Alexander Hermann. And that is, um, sorry, let me just uncover my camera so that you see who's asking. Um, thank you for the Tour de Raison, which you led us through various jurisdictions. Um, I'm teaching comparative law a bit, or dealing with it. And one question which I thought of when you spoke was, um, what shapes the local laws in particular? Is it the local culture? Uh, is it the intensity of the crime that happened? So the looting to the vict uh, against the victims, or is it an international consensus which um, then shapes the local country? So when you talk about restitution or how it's dealt with and how the negotiations are happening, um, that's my question. Well, thank you for, the, for thank you for that question. Um, very interesting. I mean, I think that. We didn't. We haven't talked about it um, much this this session. But the Washington Conference principles in 1998 that introduced the notion of fair and just solutions, which is a, an inscrutable puzzle to everyone who deals with it um, to this very day, um, I think did a lot in terms of introducing this question into the into the ethical space. And I think that most of the changes, apart from I think Austria was the only country that actually changed its law directly um, around that time in the late 90s. But every other jurisdiction that has engaged with, with the question of, of Nazi looted art in their collections and, and otherwise has tended to, to treat it as a, as a matter for, for ethical, for guidelines, for museums and other institutions, but also um, the five countries that established the panels, they don't necessarily have a uh, juridic they're not a they're not courts they don't have a juridical role um, but they have an ad advisory role and they'll base their decisions um, in large part on the the moral strength of of the claim 
Um, the UK, for example, is, a, is an interesting case study because the terms of reference for the Spoliation Advisory Panel, which of course dealt with the constable case that Bianca mentioned earlier, um, they have specifically set out that they are to consider the, the moral strength of the claim without any further definition of what that might mean. And we've seen different um, recommendations come from, from that panel in the UK. And in some decisions, they'll say the moral strength was weaker, and in others, they'll say the moral strength was quite strong, and therefore, there should be restitution. When the moral strength is not strong, they will recommend against restitution, usually. Um, so that that's, in a sense, how it's played out. But I know that doesn't answer your question, which is more about comparative law. Um, but it seems as though um, the Washington conference set the scene for this matter to become an, an ethical, more of a moral issue, rather than um, requiring countries to change their laws or getting the European Union to introduce some kind of directive. I mean, there were options, I suppose, at the time. The one outlier, of course, is the United States. And I mentioned the HERE Act of 2016. Um, in a sense, the US has decided that these issues will be played out in court, and the HERE Act makes it even easier for these claims to make it to court. Some would argue not easy enough, but um, it, it tries to remove some of those, um, those procedural hurdles, especially limitation periods. Um, so we'll get, in a sense, more cases going through the US courts. There's an important one um, in front of, part of it is in front of the Supreme Court as we speak, involving a Pissarro painting. Um, so it's, it's been a judicialized process in the United States, and there are probably reasons for that, um, whereas in the European countries it tends to be um, dealt with outside the strictures of, of law. And as a, the focus on, in, in the middle of my presentation is really on ethical practice short of the actual decision making, where we see that actually museums are engaging with these issues almost on a day-to-day -day basis, and they will sometimes return items um, and we never hear about them because they don't go through um, the, uh, the advisory process. So I think some of that needs to be recognized, just the, the, the volume of claims that are dealt with initially by museums without, without going to, to the advisory bodies. And the moral strength, just as a final remark from my side, the moral strength would then also overcome limitation periods. Yeah, I mean the 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 reason I think that the that these issues were were dealt with ethically, you know, following the Washington conference, was that was that they could then remove the the limitation issue, um, in a sense, providing justice as best you can in the circumstances and not allowing um, limitation periods and other other admin, um, legal hurdles to get in the way. Yeah, thank you Thanks very much. Thanks a lot for this first question. And I think uh, our audience has uh, um, understood the way how to interact. Uh, um, and this is very welcome. And there is the next interaction by uh, Avraham Roth. Please uh, go ahead. OK, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Alex Herman. First of all, the, all the lectures I want to say <coughs> to thank Lior and yourself, because they were highly interesting. And we heard quite a few new things. I want to ask Mr. Alex Herman, he made on his ethical side, he says that the importance of the, uh, the looted art, it depends on the interest of the claimant and uh, as a opposite the museum. Now, I want to ask you, with all respect, how can you say that somebody who is art has been looted and he has been murdered in Auschwitz, <coughs> He certainly wanted that his children or his grandchildren get this uh, property. And now you say, no, maybe the museum might be more important than the claimant. I want, by the way, and it's very shortly, just to say one sentence, that after the war, it happened in Holland many, in various times, and that the, uh, the judge said that somebody who had a shop and a new owner had bought the shop from the Nazis, that maybe he can better have them do it than the Jew who originally had the show. But this already is, I mean, there is a precedence of what you said, but I don't think it's correct for art. Thank you. 
Alex, thank, would like to react. Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Rod, and uh, it's a great honor that you're that you're here with us. And uh, I I have fond memories of seeing you in in Israel a few years ago. Um, I well, I think what I what I tried to say was that in terms of procedural fairness um, of a process of making sure that both sides are are heard and able to to put forward their their reasoning. So I I don't I don't necessarily think that the the interests of the museum should ever trump the interests of a, of a valid claimant. It was more that in the process, when the decision making body is 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 considering all of the, the factors, that they make sure that they hear from both sides. So it was more about the procedure uh, rather than rather than trying to say that, you know, a valid claim like you like the one you, you discussed um, would in any way get get superseded by the interests of a, of a museum. I hope that clarifies if I wasn't clear earlier, sorry. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, we are speaking about the legal part of our conference and we may go on for this uh, uh, on, on this part for, for, for a while and I invite uh, further interventions. Uh, meanwhile, I would uh, allow myself to ask um, a question myself to you, um, Alex. It was a fascinating uh, presentation of yours on legal and ethical aspects of the restitution process. Uh, I would just like to draw attention to something I would call a kind of paradox um, in uh, the juxtaposition between law and uh, ethics, uh, which is that um, in law, there are certain principles that are designed to uh, control the process and to eliminate uh, arbitrariness and so on and so forth. I'm just naming a few, which is, for example, um, retroactivity, the um, exclusion of retroactive uh, legislation or something like federalism. For example, in the German Federal Republic, a direct reaction in state building to the Nazi regime to exclude uh, that anything of the kind could happen again. One element of um, reacting to it is a very strong federalism. Also, there is some ethics in um, limitation periods and good faith defenses. I'm not saying that they should decide the entire case, but I just would like to draw attention to the fact that there is an ethical component in these principles as well. And uh, yet we do have the moral obligation to overcome them. I just want to describe the difficulty that we have a large principle like the exclusion of uh, retroactive legislation, and then we are confronted with the um, task and the question and the challenge to maybe overcome it in certain cases. That is uh, the case in relation to limitation periods. It is the case in relation to good faith defenses and so on and so forth. And uh, you highlighted that uh, we should move in an ethical turn towards the ethical realm away from the legal realm. That's maybe my second observation. There is not so much categorical difference between the legal realm and the ethical realm. Both of these realms are orders of normativity that function in a certain way. And the only question is, how do we decide certain concrete questions? It's not so much going from law to ethics or um, uh, 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 leaving the, uh, the, the, the legal realm. It is more the question, uh, what should be of relevance as a concrete point or not. Last example in this observation, if it is about property, property is of course a legal position and it has to be determined according to legal rules. But I think we immediately agree that the fact or the question, who is the owner or whether someone was the owner or not, is of fundamental importance in relation to a moral um, evaluation of a situation as well. So there may be more links and uh, points of intersection between the legal normativity and the ethical normativity, as I would try to put it. It's more maybe a comment than a question, but would you uh, want to react to it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a it's a very good point, and I I liked how you brought up the the the, the rules around equ equity that exist um, in certain legal systems, usually in, in common law jurisdictions, and I think that those are are t were originated when they when they were created as a way of softening the 
the blow of the law and, and do, rendering justice when a direct application of the law might not do so. It just seems as though um, those, those principles were, were unavailable, I think, for, for potential claimants in the, in the 1990s. And that's what, what prompted the, the, the move after Washington towards, towards establishing the panels and having these guidelines and codes of practice. Um, and I would say, I mean, now that we're 23 years after Washington, it seems like that has worked in, in as best it can in those countries where it's been in done in good faith. Some countries, as I mentioned in the book, I won't go into it now, um, some countries have not done well um, and have not done, honored the, 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 the basic principles of, of Washington. Um, but those that I think have taken it up and done a serious work with it. I think it's not perfect. It's a, it's a, you know, it's, I think as Martin Luther King used to say, it's the arc that bends towards justice, right? We're not there yet, but we're heading in the right direction in, in some of those countries that have taken their, their ethical obligations seriously. Um, but I, I really um, appreciated your comment, uh, Matthias. I don't know if I, I would have anything more to add to that, but it's a, it's a very good point. Thanks a lot for your considerations. Um, there is another um, uh, hand, an electronic hand by Ray Dalt. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Can you see me? Yes, yes we can see you and we can hear you. Excellent. Oh, thank you. So I, I'm dialing in from New York. So thank you for holding this conference. Um, very interested in all of the presentations so far. And I just want to address the question of law and ethics because I think if we go back in time, there really should be the same thing. And somehow over the course of history, they got messed up. So if we look at the Roman concept underlying the law of acquisitive acquisitive prescription, but the line is um, frozen. You can never get stolen property if you knew. Am I still frozen? Uh, now you are. Um, back again. Please go ahead. Okay, so if we look back in time um, at the original concepts of law and equity involving a decedent's property or stolen property, really, if a person either was on notice or should have known that the property was stolen, they could never get good legal title. So the way that statutes of limitations have come up is, in my estimation, courts applying the wrong laws and the wrong rules of equity. So if in the United States, we have jurisdictions that have construction, constructive knowledge and constructive knowledge the statute of limitations. So a fictional Jew who should have known in 1950 that a work was in a museum will start a statute of limitations. So that's historically wrong, it's ethically wrong, and it's not consistent with the Roman law and common law principles that are generally applicable. Thank you for this uh, observation on the common law. I um, ask Alex if you want to react to that. Well, I, I'm curious where it's great to have uh, Ray Dowd on, on the call, um, you know, who's acted in, in a number of these cases uh, for, very successfully for, for clients in the US. And I just wonder what your thoughts are, Ray, if I may, about um, the US being a system where these issues are litigated in court. Um, would, it, would it be better, do you think, for your clients or claimants, um, if there was a, an advisory board or some kind of com national committee that would render decisions based more on the ethical strength of a claim and then not have to worry about limitations and, and all of those kinds of, kinds of issues? I mean, is, is there a possible alternative um, to, to the system that currently exists in the, in the US? Well, if we look at the the Constitution of Austria, which is the Austrian State Treaty of 1955. Article 26 says that all property has to be, all, all stolen property has to be returned to Holocaust victims. And there's no time limit on that. So 
let's take Austria. How do you get a statute of limitations, which is an act of the legislature, to shut down the courts? Or why put procedural hurdles like making the person pay the entire amount of the property before it being able to claim it? So to me, those procedural hurdles and legal hurdles are inconsistent with Austria's constitution. That's unconstitutional. If we go back to first principles, and it was the US and the French and the British and the Russians who wrote Austria's constitution, and I can read the English language and the French can read the French language, we could all see our versions. The Austrian view of it is not, should not be um, viewed as superior to that of the allies. So the Austrian courts should be open to business for Jews making claims, consistent with their constitution. That, I mean, that's just one example, but I could go country by country and you know, describe to you why I think the courts should be open for business and would be the best venue if the proper burdens of proof were applied, right? The person who has the property and can't explain the chain of title is the person who acquired property not knowing that they didn't have a good chain of title. So if you buy a car with uh -oh. you can see it in the glove compartment. Artwork is not really conceptual, so different. Okay. Thank Thanks a lot. Lira. Uh, uh, I think that uh, Professor Knan is ready to jump into the discussion again. That's what I read from the chat. So, Professor Knan, Hagi, you're back. Uh, then we hand over to you again. Okay, thank you very much. I, I won't start telling you what happened there, but I think Rachel and I understood it. Uh, and uh, Rachel has, has my PowerPoint, at least part of it that we were able to rescue. Uh, so let me uh, return to the point I stopped. The point was that I felt that in the, in the framework of restitution, it would be very interesting not to say, from my point of view, important to think what would happen if we make room for the work of art. Now, there are two questions here. Why is it important to make room for the work of art? And what does it mean to make room for the work of art? The first, can you hear me well? Yes. The first thing it would mean to make uh, room for the work of art is not to let it be reduced to an object or to an object of property, that is a piece of property. As you notice, when we speak, usually when we speak about artworks in the, in the context of restitution, it is the, the, the language slides completely automatically between the artwork and the item, which also is involved in problems of ownership and property. I would like to begin to kind of bring in the thought, what happens if we separate the two? What happens if we don't think of the artwork under the category of property? I think this would allow us to see something very interesting about the whole framework. Now, let me try to explain. Here, for example, you see a famous, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the collector, famous um, Swiss collector, German Swiss collector, um, uh, uh, Birle, uh, who's, who now, uh, who, who used to have a big collection, private collection in Zurich and is mentioned by the lake. And now his foundation, he was a big uh, trust, uh, trustee of the museum, of the, of the Kunsthaus in, in Zurich, and uh, he's, uh, he's now there's a whole scandal about him uh, paying for a whole wing about the foundation to exhibit his collection. He has a, an amazing collection of impressionist and post-impressionist works, and here you can see him. The thing is that he was a, a German industrialist. He dealt with uh, arms and was a manufacturer of of arms. He both supported the Allies, but also the Germans, and he made a lot of money. He was at some point the, the, the richest man in Switzerland, 
but he also and he loved art and he also participated in in the whole kind of um, uh, situation of profiting from from art that was sold cheaply uh, and now one of the cases there are a few cases standing against him um, 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 uh, is of a, a Monet painting. Rachel, can you show the painting? Um, you see, it's a poppy field, uh, poppy field uh, near Vete, where he used to live. One of Monet's famous poppy field uh, um, uh, paintings. And again, we could talk about it as we talked about um, Titian Danae. Here's a poppy field. That's the name. Let's see, that, should we return the, the, the piece to the Emden family who claims that it was, uh, that we know came, was the original owner or not? And the question, just to make it clear is, what does it matter that we have a work of art here? And how does it matter? And Bianca said that for her sake, from her perspective, a work of art and a teacup or a tea is basically the same. I would want to suggest that it's not the same. And let me try to explain. I will use an analogy that is not perfect, but it just makes a point between art and the working of images. Let's see, Rachel, the, the, our next image. And this is another Cezanne painting that, that is, there are claims for because, but let, let's continue. I will, so look at this tree and you all see the face in the tree. Now, the analogy is this, when we have a work of art, we have a material object. Clearly we have a material object. The material object has certain properties. The properties, it has a weight, it has a size and it, the, the, the object is handled like many other objects. It's wrapped and shipped and it has also a financial value, et cetera, et cetera. But the work of art, like the image we see here in the tree is something that cannot be reduced to the image. What we see here is something else. We see a face in the tree. That is, we cannot think of what we see independently of our spectatorship. That is the idea of an image involves not only our perception, but also as the word image indicates our imagination. So clearly the tree is a tree and from a slightly different angle, we won't see these eyes, but from this perspective, suddenly the tree appears as something else. And this is something that often happens in art. We see one thing as something else. In the Monet painting, we saw, for example, all kinds of colors and stains, red stains, but it opened up as a field of poppies with those figures, maybe, maybe Monet's wife, children, etc. Let's move to the other next example. So here, if you wish to see, it's some snow next to a tree, but you can easily see this, the ghost in the snow. Can you detect a ghost in the snow? A friendly ghost, that is. So I want to say again, what we see here is in a way more than what we see. We cannot reduce what we see just to the objective parameters that are there. Let's go on to another example. Uh, again, here, this is a very famous example by known already from the end of the 19th century by the uh, psychologist Yasuo, it's called the duck rabbit experiment. It's a combination of lines and you can see it either way. You could, if you, you could see it either as a duck looking to the left or a rabbit looking to the right. So what is actually there? What we have is a bunch of lines, a set of lines, but we see it, we interpret it in a certain way. And what I want to say is that a work of art beyond its materiality, beyond its objecthood has or opens up meaningfully. It has meaning or it has sense. And when we talk about the work of art, 
it's interesting to think of what happens to its meaning in the context of restitution. So here I wanted, and I don't know if, what, what's the next slide, uh, Rachel, you have there? Oh, okay, so here's just another example that makes this very clear. This is uh, René Magritte's uh, famous, uh, famous um, painting called The Treachery of Images, where he tells us we, we see a pipe, but he tells us a sine pound peep. So he plays with the idea, and this is where art, again, is not equal to images. He says, here's an image. You thought it's a pipe. No, it's not a pipe. It is, first of all, an image. So there's a certain dialectics here between the givenness of the object and the kind of meaning that opens up. And this meaning can be made very complicated in, in certain works of art. Let's continue. Okay, so that's not what I, I wanted. Okay, so we, we, let's go to, to, to Zeus, for example. Here. So I intended and I had, I copied all those uh, passages from you. I wanted to bring, to, to, to kind of introduce what I thought in terms of two philosophers, German philosophers that um, um, worked in, in Germany during the 1930s. One was, uh, became a member of the Nazi party. This is Martin Heidegger. And the other one was Jewish, had to flee Germany, uh, go to France, then escape from France through uh, Spain. He thought he would be able to. And at the last moment, he didn't get the, the visa and he, he kind of found himself in an emotional corner and he com committed suicide. And Val Walter Benjamin and, and uh, Martin Heidegger are in many ways two opposites in terms of their philosophies. Benjamin is a Marxist um, and um, Heidegger has to do with the soil, the earth, the whole question of being, which is a very heavy question in philosophy. But in the 30s, in the mid 30s, they both write important essays about the work of art and its origin. And very interestingly, despite the big differences between them, I don't know if Rachel, you can find something from there and you can look at the passages, don't. Uh, let's leave Zeus in the, beginning, in the meantime. Uh, what they say is the following. They say that the present, their present, the 1930s, they talk about the process that started already much earlier. Um, yes, this, it's the next Heidegger one. Here, okay. So you see, this is what he, he talks about when he, in the first passage, he says that he doesn't want to accept uh, the trivial, way people speak about great works of art. So he asks, do we agree that there are immortal works or are these half-baked cliches of an age when great art together with its nature has departed from among men? So Heidegger, like Benjamin in a different version, think that the 1930s is a place in time in history where men can see that something had happened to the being of art. Heidegger here goes back to, to Hegel and to, Hegel, to Hegel's famous saying that basically art died. The death, what's called the death of art. Now the death of art, Heidegger explains to us in, this, in the lower passage, is not the idea that people no longer make art. You see, it's not because, uh, because people no longer have new artworks and new art movements. Hegel never meant to deny such a possibility, he says. The question remains, is art still decisive for our historical existence or is art no longer of this character? And if this is the case, the question is why this is so. In other words, what Heidegger is telling us that art lost its original essence because it no longer fulfills the roles that it used to have in society. Now, Benjamin makes a very similar move. He makes it the move 
from the um, uh, prism of technological developments. And he speaks about what he calls the age of technological or technical reproducibility or mechanical reproduction, it's sometimes translated. The idea that copy the, the um, our state of being is a state in which everything is reproduced. And while he says, of course, also in antiquity, you had copies and of course, uh, during the different stages of history, but what's new about our age is that the uh, distinction between origin and copy is lost. And the question is how we can um, um, give an authentic role to art where copies without an origin dominate us. And of course, ben, ben, Benjamin is very relevant, I think, to our state today, the state where uh, the, the basic unit of meaning is um, the, the, the file, the JPEG, the, the computer file. And today the whole discourse about NFTs, I won't, I won't go into it now, is very much relevant here. The idea to find an origin within, um, within the state of the copy. I see that in terms of time, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to finish here then. It, in, to say two more minutes and, and then say, say and find some closure. So the idea is, and this is very interesting, I think, that at the point where the Nazi regime starts to, um, to commit those uh, looting crimes, in terms of philosophical thinking, art is taken to have lost its origin. And it is taken to have lost its origin very much because of what's called instrumental reason or technological reason, which goes together with capitalism. So the question here is again, what is the connection between capitalism or instrumental reason and restitution? And do we agree that it, then in a technologically dominated era, in an age dominated by instrumental reason, it is important to make room for a dimension that cannot be subjugated to the technological or to instrumental reason. Can we see the Zeus just for an ending? Um, the Zeus came, comes to show you that this is a, a Zeus, Zeus or a Poseidon that you can see in the, in the archeological museum in, in Athens. And you see today, that it's there as an object of beauty, an aesthetic object. And if you see the other photos, you see that what's, it's, it's first of all there in order to be photographed. Different members of its body are photographed, enlarged, etc. But this, Benjamin would say, is precisely the disintegration disintegr of the origin of the work of art. And what was the origin of the work of art? The origin of the work of art had to do with a here and now of a community. And the community exercised a certain ritual. So in this case, this Poseidon or Zeus, we don't know who he is exactly, was part of a ritual, was part of a temple. It's not that he was an aesthetic object that people can come and view and photograph and take home. It was not part of the ritual. And this idea of, a, of being part of a ritual is of course connected to other things. One, community and an involvement in community. And the other thing is the idea of a transcendent, of transcendence. That is, our work of art always refers us beyond themselves to the transcendent. For example, here, the God. So these dimensions disintegrated and we are in an era where the work of art lost this uh, nature and it became mobile. It became a thing that is very much a part of the capitalist system. Now, when we rethink the whole idea, I would say that we need rethinking restitution in the light of a new understanding of art, of how art figures today, what place we want to give it today. We need to, in a way, think of this whole negotiation of taking and giving from the start. 
I won't go into it, but my plan was to suggest an alternative paradigm. And the alternative paradigm was the paradigm of the gift instead of the restitution, what a gift is. But this is maybe should wait for our next meeting or so. So again, my apologies for the technological um, uh, mess. And thank you very much for listening. Not at all, Hagi Kinan. It was a fascinating closing. You uh, presented to us uh, 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 the suggestion of a, another paradigm shift uh, towards gifts. I think this is something that is uh, discussed elsewhere, also in theology and in research on reconciliation. I may mention Absolutely. at this point that uh, the University of Bonn is in the process of uh, setting up a, a center for reconciliation research where the theologists uh, or the team uh, uh, many times referred to the notion of gift in processes of reconciliation. On the other hand, there is uh, there are property issues, there is um, an interest in justice and uh, in undoing unjust enrichments. I think this is also a strong element in the discourse that we are um, conducting um, in the context of uh, Nazi looted art and also in uh, terms of the post-colonial case. So we somehow also have to integrate this uh, dimension of undoing remaining unjust enrichments, I would say. I allow I, myself I, to go on uh, after um, Lira's uh, intervention. Uh, I think that we are running out of time, but I wanted to uh, uh, thank Bianca for her participation because she has to uh, uh, leave. So thank you. And uh, she has a wonderful, uh, has organized a wonderful conference in uh, uh, Rome in the spring, and it will be also a uh, hybrid. So everybody are uh, invited. She sent, she already sent uh, uh, the uh, information about it. And I wanted to uh, uh, go back to Hagi and connect his uh, talk to Alex's uh, talk about the post-colonial, because if we look at some of the more critical voices in Africa about the um, the capitalist turn of these events to, to, towards property, a lot of the, the criticism is uh, the, the, lo the lost notion of art as part of a living culture, including the possibility of destroying the art or of using the art in various ways that uh, uh, does not allow it to be put in a museum and how do we uh, deal with uh, this kind of uh, uh, ideas about uh, colonial injustice and that also question the whole idea of property restitution. So I think there is much to be connected now and much to be learned about the questions that you opened up, Hagi, with bringing up the crisis in the work of art and the irony that uh, um, that now in the whole restitution uh, um, program, we have gone back to this idea of origins and original owner and property uh, and losing this whole crisis uh, of asking us to, us to rethink the idea of art and a community and not just art in museum or for millions of dollars. So I thank you for bringing this uh, really ignored aspect uh, of uh, restitution. And uh, uh, to you, Professor Veller, uh, uh, about our next event next week, I hope that we'll see many of you there. Thanks a lot, Lyra. That was a wonderful closing remark on the level of contents. I um, only, I, I now go to the the organizational uh, level for our uh, last part. It's almost like in our classes, uh, we are extending, uh, exceeding the time budget extremely and people are of course leaving, which is uh, more than justified. But uh, we always said in the classes that we will stay until the last question is posed. We don't know if we can answer the question, but we will stay. Of course, uh, we nevertheless have to close formally our session, but uh, I think we may stay a little longer. After my um, formal announcements on further events, and I allow myself to start with the one you just mentioned, Lyra, uh, next week, 
Tuesday, 8 February 2022. The restitution dialogues are continued by an online session uh, organized by um, the Bill Graham Center of the University of Toronto. Mayo Moran, one of our dear colleagues, was with us tonight as well. She had to leave, uh, as I noticed from the chat. And um, she is organizing this uh, event next week um, um, that um, revolves around the book presentation of Alex's book and uh, Lyra, you will be on the panel. Other experts will be on the panel and uh, I also have the privilege to be part of it. I'm very much looking forward to it. Don't miss it. Next week, Tuesday night, we are going on with the restitution dialogues. There is another conference taking place in Israel at the end of March, 27 and 28 March, 2022. It's a conference on due diligence, digital databases and cultural property law and policy organized by our dear colleague, Professor Amnon Lehavi, the Atara Kaufman Professor uh, of Real Estate and Academic Director at the uh, Reichmann University Hard Harry Ratzana Law School. And uh, that is going to be um, a focused um, conference on due diligence, digital databases, cultural property law. I uh, received the uh, to be part of it and connected to that. That is something I would like to communicate to our students. If there are still some here, um, we were invited to apply for travel grants for some German, German students to go to um, Israel. And we received very positive signals um, uh, on this application. That will be um, a grant um, by the Office of the State of North Rhine-Westphalia in Israel. And uh, if we are lucky, we will be able to offer to you to apply for travel grants to go to Israel at the end of March. The Israel authorities tell us that the Omicron wave will have gone by then. Uh, we do hope that this is correct. And then if the best comes to the best, we might be traveling together to Israel, at least a few of us from the German bunch of uh, our joint class. And that would be a wonderful add on to what we have done during the last 11 weeks uh, together with our friends and colleagues from Tel Aviv. I hope, of course, that um, our colleagues from Tel Aviv, student colleagues as well, will also maybe uh, take the opportunity and uh, attend the conference at the end of March. Last not least, a uh, conference organized by our first excellent speaker, Bianca Gaudenzi, the restitution of looted artifacts uh, in Rome, um, 10th to, no, 16th to 18th May. Uh, I think you saw the announcement in the chat. Don't miss this uh, important event either. So there is lots to do. Uh, we will stay in a dialogue and this is uh, the best way forward in our complex issues. Anyway, uh, that's uh, what I was going to say from my side. Thank you so much for being here so long. Um, thank you very much for um, these fascinating presentations. As always, not enough time for discussion. I, we, we need to develop something about that. Uh, that was the experience in all the classes uh, Too not enough time for the questions. Next time we will better. Thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you to Alex, to Hagi, to Rachel and to Matthias and see you next week in our event.